Lauren Avedon. Ever since he saw Bruce Lee when he was a kid, he had to learn martial arts. What better place to do so than Jun Chong Taekwondo in Los Angeles? His passion led him to get cast in wonderful martial arts films, such as King of the Kickboxers, No Retreat, No Surrender 2 and 3, and he even fought Mitch Buchanan in Baywatch. Uh, of course he lost. Uh, twice. Today we dig deep into the golden eras of action movies. We do a lot of nerding out and study the details that make for successful people in this industry. An inspirational chat for sure. This is Lauren Avedon for the Bruce Willow Podcast. Dissect me, I see. I, I'm going okay. to dissect you by pieces. What are you eating? <laughs> huh? What are you eating? I'm eating my, I'm eating my once a month kind of cheat meal. Oh, yeah, right. Outside all, all morning landscaping. So I'm having corned beef hash and eggs. Terrible for you, but what the heck? You know? That's it's great, delicious. man. Yeah, I love it. You know, so, you're normal. Yeah. You're a normal human being. Everybody says, like, I'm doing this uh, 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 fasting, water fasting for 100 days. And I'm like, no, please don't. Please stop that nonsense. Yes. No, no. It's about portions. It's about, you know, eat what you want to eat, but eat healthy. And then you can cheat a little bit. But yeah. don't fast. I mean, you know, maybe even biblically speaking, when people would fast, they would still eat soup. They would still drink water. They would still do this, do that. You know, so, I mean, yes, I, I think I'm normal. Wait, let me check. Am I normal? <laughs> uh, Abby, Abby normal, you know, from uh, Young Frank. I, I don't yeah, think you're buddy. normal. I, I've seen your kicks. You're not normal. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and if you have a movie with Billy Blanks, if you would have had a movie with Billy Blanks, Keith Cook, and Lauren Avedon, that shit ain't normal. <laughs> if only. If only, right? Maybe someday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, an alternate universe. Oh, wait, way back in the nineties. Okay, yeah, it happened. <laughs> well, I so tell you, I am very finicky about what I'm going to see, and sometimes maybe this sounds bad, but I can tell from a trailer. And I didn't, you know, I, I do other things, brother. I like to be outside. I'd rather be at the beach. I'd rather, you know, do this or that. I'll tell you what blew me away is Extraction with Chris Hemsworth. Did you see that? Oh no, I haven't. Uh, no. Wow. Once every 10 years, an action film comes on that blows my mind. And this blew my mind. And sure enough, my buddy, J.J. Uh, Perry, mm -hmm. uh, to work with the director of that film, Sam Hargrave. He oh, was yeah. part of J.J.'s team for a long time. And he's the director. And they spent big bucks on that movie. And that's what J.J.'s doing right now is he's getting a film prep to do for Netflix. I think they're doing Extraction 2, and then Chad Stahelski is working on the comeback of, uh, oh, my God, what is it? Of Highlander. Oh. Highlander. Highlander. They're going to do a new Highlander. Who's yeah, this is all with? under the radar. Oh, I have okay, okay. no idea. I have no idea, brother. Mm, okay. i got another buddy, Garrett Warren, who works with um, Hugh Jackman. He plays mm -hmm. Adam on Real Steel. Oh, yeah. And this is a guy who used to be Billy Blank's um, chief instructor. And we're pals for years and years and years. I don't know if you know about him, but he was married to Joe Pesci's ex-wife, and she tried to have him killed. What? Shot him four, time, four times in the head. He was missing an eye now because of one of, the, one of the bullets. He lived, and um, she's doing 12 years in prison. 12 years? Yeah, yeah. Twelve years. So it's, it's three years per shot. Pretty much. Well, it wasn't her that did the shooting. It wasn't her. She hired a guy. 
Oh my goodness. And, uh, and they found um, her writing on some piece of paper in his car when they caught him. So obviously he wasn't the you know sharpest tool in the shed. But boy, <laughs> Garrett, Garrett, <laughs> what? Garrett, I'll tell you, Garrett, um, what do you want for five thousand dollars? Whatever it was. Anyway, so. Oh my goodness! Garrett, sometimes Garrett I listen. Lived. Sometimes I listen to these Hollywood stories, and I get it's it's so crazy. I mean, I remember that guy from Game of Death, Gig Young. Do you remember yes. that? He yes. was such a charming gentleman with such a good, great looks. He was like a Paul Newman esque type of guy, who I yeah. I watched some of his uh, uh, movies when he was younger with um, with Clark Gable and Doris Day or whatever. And the guy was like the guy was like the the, the perfect like Hollywood guy, you know, Hollywood heartthrob. And he killed himself with with a with a, a shotgun and killed his wife. So he killed his wife and he killed himself with the shotgun. It was like crazy, crazy stuff, man. How do these people end up? Some of them, actually. It's amazing how how people are, they play these characters, but they have this life, you know, mm -hmm. these lives. It's like David Carradine, kind of a scary dude, you know? I mean, really, I mean, and all of these people like Billy Drago even. I don't know if oh, you remember yeah. him from, oh, wow. I mean, darkness, dude. There is darkness there, and they come. They just have this presence on the on film. You actually had uh, a couple of uh, acting classes with Billy Drago, am I right? Which yeah, were kind of so crazy. I, well, I heard you saying in a so podcast I, that it was kind of crazy, and you were like, "Oh man, I'm not that much of a method actor. These guys are crazy. They go all the way. They go all the way to this dark, these dark places, and also using these exercises and these certain techniques." to kind of create this energy and it's it's trippy when you work with a lot of these actors or you're around a lot of these actors thank god i had a great acting coach to begin with who studied the stanislavski meisner technique mm. taught me very strictly and that's what they teach at the actor studio which is you know being it not you're not acting you're personalizing and substituting you're doing all of these things to you know get to that place because everybody has that in them and you know somebody like like dustin hoffman i can uh, there's a famous story where Lawrence olivier was coming and going to set you know playing the dentist in that in that film and dustin mm -hmm. had been up for like three days and you know doing the whole method thing i'm surprised he didn't drill a hole in his own tooth you know to do the, <laughs> do the uh, film. for marathon men right and, right and and Lawrence olivier just sort of walked over and said Dustin, why don't you just act? Oh, you know? <laughs> major burn. <laughs> like, why don't you yeah, just pretend burn. that's what we're here for? Come on, bro. <laughs> oh, no, you know, you don't have to be up for three days. And, mm -hmm. you know. Which <laughs> are some of your favorite movies? I mean, um, I'm, <gasps> if, if you have to pop up, uh, uh, I was going to say DVD, but most people don't pop up DVDs anymore, so I, I don't really know what to say. If you're going to watch a movie, which type of movie will you watch? You know, I like the old movies. Me too. I really do. Uh, like what? I, I like like Dr. Zhivago. Oh, example. nice. Mm -hmm. Like, like uh, The Man Who Would Be King. Mm -hmm. It was Michael King. Okay. And, mm -hmm. uh, and um, I can't remember the guy. Sean Connery. <laughs> uh, um, you know, and, and watch some of the old uh, things like, um, what is it? With Gene Kelly, oh, Frank Sinatra, singing in the rain. Oh, oh, uh, New York, uh, New York, New York. No, no, uh, no. Uh, it's it's Showboat or something. Or I can't remember. I was just watching that the other day. <sighs> and then there's uh, the in the singing in the rain movie is one of the best comedy routines I think ever. When uh, Which one? it's it it's it's this guy who. It works with uh, Gene Kelly's character, and he does make him laugh, make uh, him laugh. Uh, Donald O'Connor. Wow. Yeah. Talk about a great bunch of you know uh, physical comedy. I mean, that is hysterical, and he's doing these run ups the wall, and for that time, you know, uh, that was just amazing. So it was I like, like watching. 
Two or three minutes in one take, those guys were crazy. And to think that Gene Kelly actually directed it as well, I mean, that's 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 incredible. But um, Donald O'Connor, I, I believe if you go on IMDb, I watched some of, some of the trivia, like the fun facts. He was like mm-hmm. two or three days bedridden because of that scene. And you know what? He had to do it all over again because he, those guys was smoke, were smoking. They, they were very, very fit, very athletic, but they were smoking like two to three packs a day. So the guy was not was out of shape in terms of what it uh, what it was needed for that movie. So he got like two or three days bedridden, and then he had to come back. They had to reshoot because of some technical problems. So it was like, oh man, and he did like that backflip, that amazing backflip. That was probably the the first time people saw a wall flip, run right? Up, run up the wall. Yeah, yeah that man. was just amazing. And the thing about it is, if you look at that, yeah, there is carpet there. He is doing things, but he's hitting his hip hips a lot. He's doing a lot of things. You know, you know that there's some padding behind the, uh-huh. the couch. Uh-huh. You know that there's something underneath that carpet. But if you are not, I mean, the fact is, is he he was definitely an athlete. All of these guys were amazing, amazingly in shape. And Gene Kelly, and also I I don't know if you look at the stats of Don O'Connor or Gene Kelly, but a lot of these guys are not very tall. Mm-hmm, they're, mm-hmm. they're, you know, a lot of actors back then and even now, if there's something about the size or proportion when you start to get, get, to get taller actors. That was one of the things that I think it was Clint Eastwood and Dustin Hoffman. They were just out of the actor's studio and, you know, they, they were weren't going to work They're You know, they were worried about ever working again or this or that. And, you know, Hoffman is saying to, to, uh, Eastwood, you're too tall, and he's Eastwood saying him, you're too short. <laughs> you're too and, short, yeah. You know, because he's about five one. Funny story about Dustin Hoffman. After John Lennon was shot, nineteen eighty in, in New York. Yeah, I was uh, in just out of high school, mm-hmm. just graduated Beverly Hills High, class of eighty, and there was this AMPM mini market, you know, uh-huh. like where. They shot uh, the first uh, Die Hard, for example. You can see the Fox Tower. Fox Studios is the the, the place that uh, – or the, the studio that did that. Nice. But I see Dustin Hoffman because he just probably came from the studio. He wanted to get a soda or something like that. He comes out of this AM PM mini market, and I come up to him and I go, Mr. Hoffman, oh, my God, I'm such a big fan, so on and so forth. And he was like – Oh my God, I'm gonna get shot, you know, or something like that. Right? So, <laughs> don't worry, I don't. I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm not, you know, I'm not here to hurt you. I just wanted to tell you because he's a very um, humble and quiet man. Uh, but and and so that was just a, a moment, you know. So I didn't ask for his autograph. I didn't do anything cheesy like that. But I can remember seeing him. And, uh, but my mother was around all of these big stars. I was around these huge Hollywood stars when I was just a little boy. Uh, Tom Tryon, um, Richard Deacon, Joel Gray, uh, oh my God, Albert Finney, all of these Hollywood big shots. Uh, I mean, I met Muhammad Ali when I was a little kid. It's just amazing. My mom used to produce and direct television commercials. Oh. And she she got into that industry. She taught herself how to draw, so she started as an art director and then creative director. Then you know uh, started you know a woman in never mind Mad Men. Mad Men ain't got nothing on my mom. Let me tell you what, because <laughs> yeah. um, she could she could pitch. She would get in there and she would show the client all these ideas, and then she was directing commercials. She was producing commercials. And then she was around, she was hiring, she hired Richard Avedon, my cousin, to do photography on, on some particular ad campaigns. She would mm-hmm. hire all of these huge stars. And um, my mother was just a wonderful person. So I, I can remember Lauren Bacall giving up her seat on this jet that we were going somewhere in Europe just to come and sit, gave up her first class seat so she could come and sit next to my mom and coach oh. and I and talk to my mom for four hours while we were going from, I don't know, uh, from uh, Italy to, which is not four hours, actually, to two or three hours, uh, to, to England. Because you lived in England, right? 
in, in yes, Bath? Yes, I live in London. I went to Bath. We, I went to Bath actually with Fred Astaire's, uh, one of Fred Astaire's daughters and uh, her son, Tyler McKenzie, uh, Ava Astaire McKenzie. And Tyler and I are still very good friends today. Um, Tyler, Tyler actually, yeah, we were traveling around. We were kind of doing the English countryside, the Lake District, and Ava and Richard and my mother and myself and Tyler. Uh, and we went to Bath for the Hot Air Balloon Festival. And actually, wow. Bath, Bath <laughs> that's where Tyler was super, super great with me. He was like an older brother. Hmm. Um, he would take me to all of these plays in London. I mean, I can remember seeing Equus when I was 11 years old. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it's the ni- it's 1973, so all of that sort of thing. And I, and I got to see um, the Chinese Connection or Fists of Fury, I think it was called in England, with Tyler in Bath, England, and that's what really influenced me uh, as far as martial arts and as far as you know, looking at this guy who had this presence. And who didn't need anything except, you know, and you know, the reluctant hero and Bruce Lee. And I'm only eleven, I'm watching an X rated movie, and you know in Europe, violence is X rated. Mm-hmm. And you know, sex or you know, if you see a boob, oh my god, uh, it's X <laughs> over here, right? <laughs> totally got it right, you guys in Europe, let me tell you. Um, so but I'm eleven years old and you gotta be seventeen to get in this film. And I come up to the to the booth, and this British woman's like, "You're not 17." And I said, "Give me the ticket." And she gave me the ticket. It worked. <laughs> ticket to go in. And so we went to see this movie, and Tyler's not gonna Tyler's not gonna sub for me. Okay, he's like, "All right, Lauren, go get your ticket." And this is the type of you know time it was. My mother, I can remember telling me when we were in London to, to digress for a moment. I had to go to the American school in London and she, she had, we had gone by it. We had taken a cab, gone by it, but we were living on Hamilton Terrace and Hall Road. I'm nine and a half years old. It's the day to start school. She gets me ready, puts me out the door and says, okay, go find your way to school. I didn't know where the heck Loudon Road was. I didn't know, you know, I'm following these other kids who have uniforms on. I end up at a headmaster's office and uh, the headmaster calls uh, the American school on Loudon Road and says, yes, I have this young American boy here and he can't find his way to the school. How, how do I get him to go? You know, how do I get him over there? So he wrote something down for me and I ended up get, making it over there. But so um, that was her idea of, 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 of schooling you in, in independence. Absolutely. So that you was got it. around she, to doing everything. That's it. She trusted me. She she ba- mm. she made me feel like you can do it. She didn't coddle me. You know, I'd come home from school, bust my all busted up or whatever. They started a school uh, rideshare program when I was, uh, I think, second or third grade because these kids from John Burroughs in uh, mid Los Angeles were kicking my ass and taking my my uh, lunch and throwing my mm. books all over the place. They're doing this to other kids, going to this little private school. But my, my mom would uh, always be like that. She'd be like, you can do whatever you want to do. Just let me know where you are. Go here, go there. And, and by doing that, I think, unfortunately, things, you know, there's so much going on in this world. And in, when I, my daughter was uh, growing up as well in the 90s, that, you know, made us a little bit more wary and a little bit more careful. But uh, in those days, in the 60s and 70s my mother was very much about go out and do it she was a depression era child Mm -hmm. so she grew up with nothing and uh, it was up to her to make something out of herself and to do something and then my father um, his his story is pretty amazing but he never really was a dad you know he did the fun part bailed my mom uh, you know had me and made me her little man um, love child from the 60s and then dad came back when I was last year of high school at Beverly High, moved down the street and turned 18 and he asked me to take his name, which my mom had given me already. My name used to be Lauren Avedon Rains. Now it's Lauren Rains Avedon. So I have no middle name really. I have two last names. 
But, you know, he, he was an amazing man. He, he's buried at Arlington National Cemetery. He was, he, uh, he was a naval aviator with an incredible record of service. But he was president of so many of these huge companies. He was living in Rome, and uh, he was running Eve of Rome. He married a principesa, Princess Luciana Pignatelli, Avedon. And uh, she, she um, killed herself, I think, in 2008 after the stock market went. And she was, I think, 78 years old and had no money. And so she just uh, she did a Marilyn Monroe, took a bunch of sleeping pills and drank some vodka, and that was that. But um, so I was around all of this stuff and all these people in high school and growing up, but I had nothing really. I was, I got the hand me downs from the rich kids, from my mother's friends and whatnot, but I got to be around all of these people and then have to, I don't know, adapt, right? Yeah. And you're so, an only child, right? You're an only child? Only child. And Same I have here. an only child. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, uh, but you probably had a whole home. You probably had a mom and a dad, right? Uh, the, they were the divorced. Uh, they were divorced as well okay. since I was uh, 10 years old. So I grew up with my mother, basically. And I am feeling what you're saying in a special way because I felt that freedom. I could do anything and my mother would for sure trust me. How would she look at your, later on, your willingness to start martial arts? Did she uh, actually support that or was she a little bit on the opposite side at first? No, she did support that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the thing about it is, is I was a pretty good kid. You know, I got into some trouble when I was in high school, but... You know, and she would tell me, Lauren, if you don't get into trouble every once in a while, I'm going to think something's wrong with you. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. Great perspective. <laughs> yeah. And Great she, would perspective. Say, she would always say, look, I don't want you up in some alley over here. You know, if you got a gal, your girlfriend, whatever, come over, you know, I'll, I'll make myself disappear. I'd rather have you at home. I'd rather know what's going on. And so, you know, she always gave me that kind of, that, that trust But yeah, I know that there's a lot of things that scared the living pants off of her, especially when I started doing films overseas and stuff like that. But as far as martial arts goes, I, she would drive me up to Bel Air and all around to Beverly Hills to wash and wax cars so that I could make enough money to buy my own car so that I could pay for what I needed to pay for. I didn't get an allowance until or, or uh, after 12 or 13, I mean, my mom would take me to this, this place called Miller's Outpost where you could buy shirts. I don't know if you know the store, okay? It's many moons ago. <laughs> She'd buy me two pairs of pants, uh, five, you know, two, three packages, pairs of socks, five shirts, a new pair of shoes, and uh, some, un you know, some new underwear. And that was it for the year. Like, okay, that's it for the school year. You want anything else? Get a job. Get a do, job. Do so, mm -hmm. so that's the thing. And then after high school, I drove one of the first places I drove. And, and my dad, he's like, get a Volkswagen bug. You know, it's really economical. He doesn't sound like <laughs> that. But anyway. <laughs> and breath of soul is not with us anymore. But So I got this freaking Volkswagen bug, which was was really not that cool. You know what I mean? Like, you know, let me pick up this gorgeous gal that I just asked out and I show yeah, up. In Bel Air. <laughs> yeah. yeah, or wherever. One of the first places I went to was Jun Shang Taekwondo because wow. I, I was still in love with Bruce Lee and wanted to be just like that guy. How old were you? And I was, uh, I was, just about to turn 18 because hmm. uh, my birthday is is this uh, next coming month so i i went into june chung because uh a couple of friends of mine had gone to that school in in beverly high so i knew them and i knew that they were there doing their thing and there were only a few other places to go like there was kung fu sansu there was shotokan karate There was Emil Farkas's Beverly Hills Karate, and uh, <laughs> you know, so so I go to Jun Chung, and I walk in, and there was this Israeli guy, and uh, he was just there practicing during the day. I walk in, and he runs from one side of the school to the other, 
flies through the air, kicks the heavy bag, folds it in half, it swings up, hits the ceiling, swings back down. And I'm just like, wow, I want to learn how to do that. I, I said to him, I said, can you do that again? Remy was his name, terrific guy. And he did it again. He was, boom, you know, and, uh, and I was like, wow, that is phenomenal. So I went in, I can't remember who I talked to there, but I got a schedule and uh, you got a free, either a free, I think a free week uh, or at least a free trial lesson. Hmm. So I came back that night. I had all there was back in those days was the gray sweat pants or gray, <laughs> gray sweat here. You know, you had, you had those. And, and um, so I came back and I took a class with Simon Ree. Oh, Dehan. Yeah. And I thought I was in shape, Bruce. I thought, oh, yeah, I'm a distance runner. Ah, da, 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 da. I think I, you know, I'm in shape. I'm <clears throat> half an hour into the first of for 15 minutes with stretching. I mean, half an hour, 40 minutes in the class. I'm just like, <sighs> I can't breathe. And I can remember trying to unzip my sweat jacket. Now, this is July, you know, or something like that. So it's. Uh, but whatever. So I'm trying to get Simon Ree was behind me and zipping it up before I, I knew what was going on. He's like, keep your, keep your shirt on. Mm. So I just fell in love with it. I'm like so challenged by this. So I literally went home and I begged my mom. I said, mom, please, please. I need the, the, at least the first payment for the six month program, please. I, this is so important to me. I'm, I'm already registered for school. I already paid for all my classes. I bought my books, you know, all this stuff for, to go to, to start junior college. And she said, okay, all right. So she wrote me a check. I went in, I uh, paid, bought the uniform and I was there every day, except I mean, it was the beach school, you know, for summer school and uh -huh. June show. And I got to tell you, Bruce, my ribs hurt from breathing, not from getting hit or done. They didn't do anything like that. Yeah. My ribs, my ribs were hurting because mm -hmm. I was breathing so hard because you, you know this probably because you train, right? Yeah. You do martial arts. Right? The intercostal. So it was so explosive, all of mm -hmm. these movements that we were doing. I was used to running. You know, I could, I could get in the zone break that wall and then be breathing without breathing hard because I'm running, you know, 10 miles or something like that. Well, forget it. You know, totally different set of muscles, totally different principles. Totally yeah, the fast you're twitch. Everybody gets that little encounter with I'm feeling muscles that I did not know I had when they go to martial Ooh. arts or boxing or whatever, because of the, the intercostal or what do you call it in English? The serratus, serratus muscles. You're, you're like, oh, I can't breathe. It's like my diaphragm is dilated. Everything hurts. It's so crazy. Oh. Yeah, I love it. And, and the thing about uh, Jun Shan, which was so phenomenal, was they had this super structured system, hmm. white, and yellow belt and so forth. Uh, and then purple and orange had a separate class and, uh, and then blue belt through whatever black belt had, we were in the advanced class. So I remember after two weeks I was doing Gicho Young Ilbu. Okay. Number the first form for this, um, uh, Taekwondo style that master Chung sort of adapted between Tang Sudo and Taekwondo. Mm -hmm. Um, and mastery said, Lauren and so-and-so are the worst in the class. And I'm like, God, he's never going to say that again. So that was, you know, and it, it, they knew how to motivate you, not by hitting you or by, you know, doing things that other styles do like Shotokan or whatever, you know, they, they whack you mm -hmm. with the Shinai. No, no, no. They whack you with push-ups. They whack you with drills. They whack you with explosive technique. And I wanted to be super perfect. So thank God for mom, getting back to mom, uh, supporting me in that. She never would come to classes. She never did come to my testings mm. uh, because I think she she probably would have seen if I did get hit. She probably would have run onto the mat, <laughs> <laughs> whoever it was, and just beat him. 
scratched him and beat him up. She, she just didn't, she didn't, you know, I'd come home and I'd be like, I'm fine. I'm fine. You know, and then I get my own apartment. But that is amazing because it's a really, I find that it's a really fine line between you saying, okay, this guy is pumping the hell out of me and motivating me. <laughs> But I believe that either Simon Ree and I, I'm sure Philip Ree, I'm, I'm not sure, was he an instructor there as well or just a student yeah. like you yeah. at the time? Yeah, yeah. Philip Ree, Simon Ree, it was Peter Lulgeri. Uh, there, They would have these kind of guest instructors that would come from Korea. Wow. But mostly it was uh, Master Simon Ree that was teaching the beginning mm. classes. And then mm. Master Philip Ree, and then Master Philip Ree would teach the, the, the kids' classes. And that was something that I ended up doing eventually was teaching the kids. That's excellent. But, uh, no, because it it's a fine a line. Problem. What I was trying to say is it, it was, it, it's a fine line between you saying, okay, this guy's motivating the crap out of me, or you saying, this guy's an idiot. I hate him. He's treating me badly. Uh, so it, it must have been something that that independence that uh, your mother has uh, developed in you must have had something to do with you. I want to come back. Because a lot of people get so frustrated with the first few attempts at doing martial arts that they never come back. It's really a, a barrier to entry in some cases. Yeah. You know, and that, that was, can be so. And that was old school enough. You know, exactly. Hmm. And uh, just watching a, uh, um, just to digress for a second about old school, Sure. watching uh, this, uh, uh, it's gay, G-A-E, I guess you say it, gay, uh, this old school Muay Thai trainer. And he is just brutal with people, brutal. You can look him up on YouTube. It was something on uh, Facebook with him doing some training where he's sweeping people. I mean, look, they wouldn't really abuse you, but when you would see Master Reed do something, like Simon Reed do something, he's not asking you to do anything that he can't already do, and he's going to nurture you. He's going to show you. He's not going to get in your face and yell at you. But he, you know, he knew how to motivate people individually. Like you learn, you learned this. I know you learned this. How to read people mm -hmm. and what they need to make them, you know, go further. And the other thing is, is in those days, you know, end end of the seventies, eighties, people were there to learn how to fight. You know, people were there to learn how to handle business, handle themselves, to to forge themselves into a certain type of of person. And I was just so challenged. I just, I needed male role models, right? And these were the perfect male role models for me. When I went into that place, it was like church, Bruce. I mean, it, it was like going to church. It was like being a monk, but uh -huh. you know, going outside and they had all of these, 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 uh, these great people there. And uh, they, it just, the place just exuded this energy of, of martial discipline. And I needed that discipline. And when Master Ree said that, he knew that that was going to motivate me. That coddling me or, you know, like they do at some of these McDojos now, you know, people that <laughs> have, a, they have their little belt there with their certificate when they come to test. No, 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 no. Wrong. You know, even with, look, when I took my yellow belt test over there, I thought, oh, okay, I, I'm going to die. Somebody, I'm going to, I'm going to die in this test. Somebody's going to kill me or something, you know, it was that whole feeling. And then you get through that, they get past that very, probably my two tests that were hardest for me were white to yellow belt and then red double stripe to black belt, because uh -huh. those were two unknowns that, um, exactly. You know, unknowns. Because the first time you're being tested is from white to yellow, so it's got to be one of the most horrific experiences ever. There's uh, there's a picture on Facebook or whatever from my black belt test where I'm breaking two bricks. Uh, the photographer uh, Hal Frazier, very dear friend of my mother's, had that perfect time. He was standing outside. Jun Chung had these. It was basically a Chuck Norris studio that Master Chung had bought back in the '70s. I think it was '74 or something like that. He bought from uh, from Chuck Norris. So it was really well designed uh, uh, place. So it had these two open, these full glass doors uh, that would open in the to the corner. So those doors were open in that August tenth day when I tested for my first on black belt. And Hal was outside there, and he caught that that shot of me just right as the bricks are breaking, and and you can see the panel there, 
And, um, and then there's one of my students too, or one of the guys who end up being my students and you can see him in the mirror and he's doing this. He's like this, like, I can't believe this guy's about to do this. <laughs> That's <laughs> crazy. <laughs> but yeah, so having, having a uh, master Reed there and, and uh, master Philip Reed, just amazing influence. Uh-huh. You know, they, let, they had this grace and this, this energy about them. I mean, Master Philippry, I mean, he just was like a cat. You know, he would mm-hmm. just walk. He was so graceful in his movement and, you know, just an amazing athlete, amazing martial artist. And uh, so having those influences, I just was like, I, I, I want to be like these guys. I don't care what it takes. I don't care what happens. I want to be just like these guys. And Master Chong would tease me and say, Lauren, go get out of here. Go, you know, do something else. Get, you know, and I'm like, because I would just sit there and watch them. Because there was a, like a window waiting room area and a, yeah. you know, window where you could walk through and see the mat and watch the classes. And I was just riveted watching watching Master Chung train with uh, Simon and Philip. And they're coming this close to, you know, taking their face off and stopping. And, you know, it's just like amazing. And at that age, too, I needed that. I yeah, really did. Yeah, so for sure. Pain, yeah. So then, ahead, one buddy. faithful day, you're already. I'm, I don't know, a couple of years into the martial arts. I'm, I'm guessing you're probably a, bla- a black belt already. And uh, was it Roy Haran who called yeah. the, the, the Jun Chong uh, Academy in order to find a tall, good looking, Western looking guy to make this great movie? Yeah, it was the weirdest thing. I, I mean, who calls a karate studio at 9.30 at night on a Friday night? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I just happened to be there because I had just gotten back, uh, and you probably heard this before, from six weeks in Africa. I went on a safari with my father and my uh, father's wife, Silvana, uh, and we had an amazing time. I met amazing people over there, and I came back because I had given up my apartment. I'd given up everything, so I was working at Claude Short Dodge in Santa Monica selling used cars. Oh, really? And I hadn't sold any cars that week. I think it was my second week on the on the job, and I was just itching to train. So I had a key to the studio, key to the school, and I just went there on that Friday night to to hit the bag to to do something. And this chap was um, cleaning the school. Phone rings, and uh, he doesn't speak English all that great. So he says, "Lauren, can you can you talk to this guy?" Um, and I said, sure. So <clears throat> I did the whole, uh, hello, this is Junshan Taekwondo. How can I help you? And he said, uh, this is Roy Haran from seasonal films. I'm looking for a guy above. Did you know who he were? And, did you know who he was at the, t- at the time? Cause he's the guy from snake and Eagle shadow, right? I guess. I mean, I didn't know him from a, a hole in the wall. All I knew is he said, you know, I'm looking for a guy above six feet tall who can do martial arts and act. And I said, you're talking to him. Now, I had taken acting as a lark, basically. I met this guy who, who uh, was in an acting class with um, uh, what was his name? It was uh, Alan, Alan Landers, he called himself, but his name was really Alan Levine. But he did, he did this uh, Stanislavski Meisner acting mm-hmm. technique class. We both met, this guy and I, um, not too far away from Jun Chung. My doctor, Dr. David Gans, he would see patients in Beverly Hills and they didn't have the money to pay him. Well, I'm, I pay for my own doctor bills. My mom wasn't going to pay for my doctor bills for this or that, right? So I owed him a lot of money and I was at his house, painting his house, sanding the floors, you know, uh, doing whatever it was. And I like met this guy. <laughs> said, you think, yeah, right. He send should, the floor. well, <laughs> send the floor. Wax the hall, no wax the hall. <laughs> so you were so you were Daniel's son <laughs> yeah, yeah for, for my doctor not for Mr. Miyagi yeah, for to pay doctor. my bill that is so great anyway so, you know, so the thing is, is you, know, it's, you know I had to pay my bills man um, so <laughs> this guy's like you can go to my acting class you'd be great I'm like yeah you know. and I had been in all these little television commercials because my mom would throw me in there when you know, uh, she needed somebody for the May Company commercials or for this or for that or whatever. But I was like, ah, I don't really, you know, so she said, come on, come on, just come. And I remember going to this acting class and like 
he gives me a, a piece of paper, you know, a piece of paper with some lines on it to read. And I'm, there's just 12 people in the room and I'm, I'm holding this piece of paper like this <laughs> and I'm shaking like a leaf and I'm like, I don't like this, you know, so at least I can learn about, you know, public speaking or do something. So I had some training as an actor. So Roy Haran says, great, you know, I'm auditioning people, uh, blah, blah, blah. So he says, come to this address in Altadena uh, tomorrow at whatever it was, four or five o'clock in the afternoon. I said, okay, great. So I gave him my home number. He calls me the next morning. He says, I have to cancel. I have to reschedule. I'm like, sorry, Roy, I've got to come today. It's the only time I have to come because I just knew, Bruce, I knew I had to get in there, you know. And it was a good thing I did. So went there, impressed him. And uh, a week later, you know, was just chewing my nails, waiting to hear uh, if I got the job or not. And sure enough, I got the job. So did Matthias Hughes. Matthias yeah. uh, replaced Jean-Claude Van Damme. I replaced Kurt McKinney. Jean-Claude didn't want to go to Thailand because he'd been abused already on the first No Retreat, No Surrender, and they shot it in L.A., Oh, really? How, how, how so people, abused? How so? Well, put it this way. When you're working with the Chinese, especially back then, you're expected to, to take punishment. You're hmm. expected to be hit, to you know, do these reactions, to work ridiculous hours, and be under very, very difficult circumstances. And look, Kurt McKinney at that time, he, was, he had a great job on a soap opera. So mm. he was getting good week for working doing a you know a very difficult job i mean those guys get up at 4 a.m they're on set by 5 6 and then they're they're doing their thing all day long i can't remember the name of the soap opera he was on but so he, it wasn't too hard for him to be convinced not to go to thailand <laughs> and uh, go through all of the, the 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 things that they went through and, and jean claude he had blood sport was on the shelf for a couple of years and he was kind of waiting for that to come out uh, and he was doing other things. I mean, Jean Claude had, I guess he, I guess he was the original Predator guy, you know. Uh, and then he quit. Oh, you know, the Predator, know yeah. He was the he was uh, paid to, yeah, to be paid to be in the suit, and you know he just uh, couldn't deal with it or or whatever. And you know Jean Claude has his own issues, mm -hmm. which we won't discuss. Uh, because it's too lowbrow to, to really get into. But the fact is, <laughs> is that, um, yeah, they chose me. Roy chose me. Now, look, I, I have to say this in all fairness. Uh, Keith Strandberg did write the script originally, but Roy hijacked the script. Uh, and um, Keith Strandberg was not around for the shooting of No Retreat, No Surrender 2, although, you know, uh, he kind of takes credit for it. Boy has disappeared in some into some cave in China. I don't know where he is, but um, Roy was. Um, yeah, I mean, I still didn't have the job. We didn't have the job even when we got to Thailand, Matthias and I, because Yun Kuei, Corey Yun Kuei, the yeah, director, yeah, Corey, yeah, yeah, yeah. He he. We just got off the plane, and uh, I'm in the middle of the hallway in the Ambassador Hotel. 12:30 in the morning uh not in the morning like daytime i mean nighttime and roy says something to, to yun kuei in jap in japanese in cantonese and uh we do a little a quick little fight gaff in the hallway there to show reaction and you know things like that and he says oh, okay okay and then he took off down the, the hallway and then we did a screen test the next day with matthias and i in the parking lot in the parking lot of yeah. the Ambassador Hotel, where the two of us just walked together and we were looking at each other. And so that he, he could see, you know, the, the, the camera test, right, the mm -hmm. screen test of the way we looked on film. Because it's interesting how you can see, and you probably encountered this, you can see a person and how they look in real life. And they look a, a little bit different. Or Quite different. Camera, yeah. Yes, the camera does something to them, and it's either good or bad or indifferent. But... Um, so we both looked good on film. We looked good as, as opponents and as opposites. And so that's, that's how it began. But um, Keith wasn't there, you know, the whole shoot. And, uh, you know, Keith, Keith and I get along, but um, I think he kind of, 
you know, we, when we got together for Blood Brothers for No Retreat, No Surrender 3 mm-hmm. uh, with Keith Valley, his very dear friend, he really, I don't know, he, I don't know if he kind of, I don't think he liked me. It, it, he kind of, I guess, it, it, it was personal, but it wasn't personal because Roy had hijacked his film. Roy had chosen me, he hadn't chosen me. And, um, you know, so I think, and then through No Treat, No Surrender 3, Lucas was listening to me like we wanted, you know, we had to change everything around because Keith had broken his arm mm. before we started shooting. You know, he, we did the stunt test and he broke his arm in three places and NG came to me, started to go to No Retreat uh, 3, but uh, to say, Lauren, do you know anybody who can play your brother? And I said, no, which means you're not going to dump, you're, you're not dumping him. If you yeah, dump him, dumping Keith Vitale, yeah. you know, you're not dumping him because he was one of my heroes growing up. Uh, when I was amazing. News. Yeah. He was just an amazing fighter. He, he was only really on the circuit for about three, three and a half years. But, you know, I know I, since, since then he's come to visit me here in Florida many times. And we're, we're really, really good friends. We are mm-hmm. like brothers. Uh, and he's just an amazing guy. So, I mean, to make a film with him, plus we were perfect. We were perfect for each other as far as playing brothers, but in any case, so yeah, I just rewatched Strand- that movie yesterday. Yeah, it's oh, so man. nostalgic, man. Uh, I tell you, you know, there's some, there's always, a, it's, I, ha- I have trouble watching myself. My daughter will tell you this. Really? Uh, she'll, yeah, she'll want to, <laughs> she'll want to watch some of these movies. I'm like, God, uh, no, it's okay. You know, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of things. Look, when you were on these films with a Chinese director, you don't have any direction. Their mm. idea of acting. Is this overblown, you know, thing? So I would do my thing as, as that I thought worked, and then they're not going to get, they're not going to stop shooting until they get what they want, and that's sometimes what they choose and end up mm. using, whatever it is. So you know, the fact is, is that by the time King of the Kickboxers came along, Strandberg was basically like, Lauren, you're going to say every word that I've written the way I've written it. And I'm sorry, Kisa, he's a, he's a very nice guy, but sometimes dialogue, you know, you're hired to play a character. And as long as you get the character's, you know, intent across, you should be able to manipulate the words a little bit or, or be the character. Because he got so upset on Blood Brothers, Keith. He got so upset because Lucas would be looking at me or I'd be working with whatever actor and rewriting the scene. And he's like, well, what about me? And I'm like, well, look, we're in here. We, we got to shoot this. We got to do this. We don't have time for you to go and think about, you know, what the best line is. We're just, I'm the character. Let me just, you know, say this or this or that. So he was very frustrated with that mm. whole situation. Okay. Yeah. But you know, he's great. He's a great guy. I, I can totally understand his point of view, but um, so back to no retreat, no surrender Two, doing that film. That was a great, great learning experience for me. I mean, I went from zero to hero. I got to work with Cynthia Rothrock. I got to work with Huang Jun Lee. Um, they had they would sub in directors sometimes because you and Quay would have to go back to Hong Kong to do this or that. So um, I can't remember the the young uh, the guy who did uh, Wheels on Meals with Keith Vitale um, or with Jackie Chan. His uh, co star, Be- Benny the Jet. Not Benny the Jet. No, oh, Yun Biao. Yun Biao. Yun Biao. Yun Biao. Yeah. Yun Biao came directed some of the some of the uh, bits of No Retreat No Surrender 2 when oh, wow. Quay had to go back to uh, Were you to at Hong this point Kong. were you at this point already a fan of those movies had you seen a lot of stuff back then like uh, I don't know the Drunken Masters the Young Masters the oh, the Golden Harvest yeah. stuff the or just the yes. Bruce Lee major pictures You know we had something in in the states called Kung Fu Theater right mm, so yeah. it would be on late at night and I was an aficionado. I would, I would buy these videotapes from this little uh, video store in San Francisco, Chinatown mm-hmm. in San Francisco mm-hmm. that had these movies, you know, otherwise you had to catch them on TV. You can't, you couldn't find them. So snake and the Eagle shadow and drunken master, I think was on Kung Fu theater. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, and Yun Kui, I mean, excuse me, uh, Huang Jun Li is in that, you know, uh, in Drunken Master. Um, so, were but in you, any case, w- w- where I was trying to get I is, were you kind so of familiar, not? I was not oh. so familiar with all of these 
a really mega incredible actor director okay. talents i was not it, it's good uh, that you were not starstruck because that maybe helped you get your mojo on because you were you were playing kind of a not kind of you were playing a cocky guy <laughs> get to that ring <laughs> and you say really this is muay thai <laughs> that's great yeah, really. <laughs> really and i got it and my teacher teach me taekwondo you know, <laughs> my boxing all the same and uh but you know roy roy was around for all that you know mm -hmm. keith was probably when he saw the film was probably going oh, so roy you know, was already it. as it demanding awesome. so roy was already as demanding as the chinese he was basically a chinese guy in working yeah, method more, more than basically mm, okay. he was he was always trying to save face he was he was spoke cantonese like uh, you and i are speaking english mm. and he had this ideal of you know keeping face and saving face and you know uh being one of them absolutely i mean he pulled a machine gun on max thayer a, a literal live italian machine gun when we were sitting on set in that one Uh, building that Matthias and I had that epic fight mm. in mm -hmm. uh, where I hit him over the head with Lennon and um, with the picture of Lennon because it was <laughs> raining. It was raining cats and dogs and other little woodland creatures and it was not going to stop. And Max is like, why are we here? <laughs> It's not going to stop. Let's get out of here. Let's go back to the hotel and rest. And, you know, because it was all so hotter than blazes. Anyway, and so Max went and grabbed the keys from one of the, the Thai drivers and started to drive the, you know, the, the van away. And here's Roy running out there with a live machine gun. <laughs> I mean, not great for blanks. You can't and make that up. In front of the thing, and Max is in there laughing. He's like, because <laughs> Max is a Vietnam era vet anyway. He's used to having you know bullets fly by his head. I think he was a medic in uh, in Nam. Um, oh in, my in, in goodness, the stuff he must have seen. So there you go. So you know, you're pointing a guy, a gun at a guy who you know will is not afraid of you pointing the gun at him. So <laughs> it, 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 it was just you know, it was a series of really intense you know, learning experiences over there. I got sick a lot. Oh yeah. I had it coming out of both ends. Thailand, baby. And, <laughs> Thailand, baby. and you're, you're there, you know, working in the middle of nowhere with the Thai army as all these extras mm -hmm. with, um, really, really harsh conditions. I mean, food was this little, you know, tiny truck coming out with a plastic clear plastic bag full of soup pouring mm -hmm. it in a, a tin terrine that was maybe washed in 1947 <laughs> there's, there's, charcoal, there's charcoal underneath it and they're heating it up and then they've got the rice and whatever and, and then the chinese are telling me well lauren lauren don't eat too much because you're fighting after after lunch i, said, I can't eat this anyway it's okay um But there's something that, really funny about this. Like, there's something really funny about a guy, even though you were not like a, a posh kind of kid, you know, who hadn't been anywhere else but Beverly Hills. But still, a Beverly Hills kid going into Thailand to work with, you know, <laughs> work with all those crazy guys. I mean, just look at Roy Horan. He looks crazy. He looks a little crazy. I mean, I remember Tower of Death, little, Game of Death 2, where, where he has crazy. all those lions. Have you seen that movie? It's like he's drinking blood. I mean, that's what he looks like in real life. I mean, I look at him, he's like, no, for sure he has lions. This guy has lions for sure. <laughs> so that's that's, that's a great imagery. He, he, was a, he was crazy as a March hare. We all knew that. <laughs> and, uh, and the fact is, is that, um, you know, you, you had to just be ready for anything. Mm -hmm. And I think going back to what we were talking about earlier, you know, about our moms and about situationally being in, just having to adapt. And look, I I genuinely thought, Bruce, and you're going to go, okay, this guy's being dramatic. I genuinely thought that these guys are just going to kill me at the end of the film. And uh, they're going to go back to Hong Kong or go wherever, and it'll be, oh, we don't know what happened to him because of the way they were treating all of us really. And, um, 
finally, uh, you know, I would call my mom every week. Back to mom. Mm -hmm. Mom, did you check my bank account? Did they wire the money? You know what I mean? And uh, so at least she'd have some money to, to bring back the body if they found it. Literally, I was to that point thinking, these blank blankety blanks are going to kill me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and that was okay because I had nothing to lose really and everything to gain if everything went well. And I did sign a three-picture deal with them. It was not exclusive, but it kind of was exclusive. And we had such incredible experiences over there. And then getting back to uh, going to uh, Hong Kong to shoot some of the some of the uh, interior parts or some of the things, you know, because mm. back then shooting on film, you start to assemble, you do the rough edit, and then you you pick up kind of things that need to be picked up. Mm -hmm. You do the missing shots. You you know while you still have your two main leads and whatever else, you just you know put them up, and then they go to you know work in the studio or they go do this or do that, and to 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 get some of those missing shots. Um, so we were in in the Kong anyway for a while, and then. Uh, and we went back home, but I can remember walking down the street uh, in uh, Kowloon or in Sinsatsui with uh, Cynthia Rothrock, and she's and she was so sweet. She still is. She's a, she's such a sweetheart. Um, and then all the Chinese going Lothalak, Lothalak, because we're walking down the streets in Hong Kong, you know, and it's uh, she's on the movie screen. And, uh, so everybody and knew her in, already. Yeah, everybody knew who she was. And I think she was uh, she was living with Yun Bio at the time. And I actually, she was sweet enough to let me stay the night, just sleep on the floor in their apartment. He was oh, really? busy working. Yeah, she let me sleep on the floor. It was like Christmas time, 1985 or six or something like that. After that, you had like a, a two-year hiatus. Right, oh, uh, so so you didn't sign that record, uh, that um, uh, picture deal right away, or did you? Oh, I did. I did. I had. I, I was told by Haran mm -hmm. to go to Century City, uh, which was I walked up the hill to Century City because that's how close my mom's place was to to Century City and to Beverly Hills High School. Walked up the hill and signed the. I was twenty, not quite twenty three. Just or just turned twenty three, something like that, and he said, "Sign this contract. I don't care if you read it or not. We're not changing anything in it. Go sign it or don't sign it by you know three o'clock this afternoon." Okay, so I walked up and I didn't even read the contract. I just signed it and had two two other pictures in there, options for two other pictures, mm. which is smart. You know, once you find. Um, an actor and you can sign her for an option. It doesn't mean that, I mean, it was a pay or play option, mm -hmm. Yeah, but there wasn't, there wasn't such a thing really with that situation because these weren't SAG films. Oh, you know, okay. These weren't, uh, these weren't union films. Mm -hmm. These were back in the day where, you know, you could go anywhere in the world, but if you were in the United States and I did have my a card, I got my A card in 1984 as a Pepsi Slice black belt. Again, somebody calling the studio, the Junsheng studio, looking for martial artists. So me and Mark Hicks, you know, yeah. who was uh, Chris uh, Chris Tucker's double and so, did so many other uh, great things. He's it's the he's, guy from uh, the casting, right? That 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 funny yeah. video that everybody yeah. laughs about, but the guy's amazing. Yeah, he is amazing. <laughs> And he was always the guy winning these uh, jump front kick contests and things like that at these tournaments wow. that we would do. Uh -huh. And uh, just an amazing athlete, a great guy, really super guy. And um, so, yeah, so he, me and Mark Hicks and then the Castro twins uh, were the females. And then there was one other gal and then myself were the Pepsi Slice Black Belts. It's the extra kick. Juice. We got the juice. We got the black. So just out of the gate, I joined SAG 
because of that commercial. Oh, because they okay. tapped they taffed hardly me in the SAG, but I hadn't done anything. I was running around trying to get commercial jobs and doing this or that uh, with a with a pager on, you know, going <laughs> with here a pager. A pager, and uh, so, but the the three picture deal was, you know, anytime you find somebody and you if it does go well, you know, which No Treat No Surrender came out in twenty five hundred theaters across the United States, mm, the nice. Shapiro Entertainment. Yeah, and we did a better per screen average than Dolph Lundgren and, and Red Scorpion, oh. and uh, so it was cool. I mean, and I thought, oh, this is great. You know, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna work, and you know, I'll do something. Nothing, nothing happened. Oh. Uh, I think uh, it's Isaac Florentine who says, "Lauren, you were before your time," um, and uh, that movie was so unique. It was so entertaining, and. Uh, People loved it, but then where do you go from there? You know, uh, Hollywood is a machine. You know that, Bruce. I mean, Hollywood is a machine. Mm -hmm. They keep their actors working. They keep their group working. They keep the people working that they want to to work and to be on top. And uh, you know, there's it's the art of the deal, but it ain't Donald Trump. You know, so the (laughs) thing is, it's uh, that's the thing. You you, Mm -hmm. people in that entire world there like how could steven seagal all of a sudden pop out of nowhere because he was teaching mike ovitz the head of caa creative artists agency Mm -hmm. uh uh, he was teaching him aikido and uh, rachel ward was his wife at the time who was represented by mike and now all of a sudden he's starring in above the law I can remember going outside Jun Chung and lo- opening up the, it was a little one of those newspaper things you put in a quarter or whatever you get your newspaper. And I open it up, I flip it on one, and I flip it to the entertainment section. And here's this guy, you know, Steven Seagal or whatever. I'm like, who the hell is this? You know, I'm, I'm expecting to, to read about Clint Eastwood or something, somebody like that. And here, here he is. But so that's the machine. Yeah. And, um, Speaking of the machine, I mean, I mean, if you don't want to talk about about this, we're not going to talk about it. I can edit that later. But uh, I saw this uh, little video with a little bit of your bio, and it says that you had a couple of run-ins with a few actors that you did not go along with, and because of that, you did not sign, or so- something happened that made you not sign something. I I really don't remember who they were. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on that, or you don't want to talk about absolutely. it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Look, here's the thing. Hmm. Um, when I, one of my students was Lorenzo Lamas. Oh yeah. Lorenzo okay. Lamas. Yeah. Lorenzo Lamas. From and, Falcon uh, Crest. Falcon Crest. If it wasn't <laughs> for his father, Fernando Lamas, he would be just flying helicopters, which is pretty much what he does now. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, great guy. Uh, really, really good athlete. But I had sort of talked my way into, this is really my fault, talked my way into helping to choreograph a self-defense uh, video that Lorenzo was going to do. And we were shooting at his little Malibu house. And I choreographed this thing for him. And I said, listen, mi- miss me by a mile. But he didn't miss me by a mile. He took my nose and he put it over here and, you know, broke my orbital bone here and whatever else. And, you know, my eye was, you know, was messed up, right? So... That was one character, right? So in in this play that we're gonna we're talking about, the mm-hmm. other one was Sherry Rose, who was um, basically Lucas Lowe really liked her. I don't know. He floated her boat. It's the same thing. There were greater. Look, I never saw her in casting. I don't remember seeing her in casting because I was part of casting for for Blood Brothers and for King of the Kickboxers, but. Um, Sherry played uh, some role in the beginning of Blood Brothers in the bank. And um, then, right, all of a sudden she's Mm. cast as my love interest in King of the Kickboxers. Mm. Well, Sherry Sherry was, you know, she was a nice enough gal. But she, she came to the set one day out in the middle of nowhere to do this hot tub scene with me and to, to do this thing at Prang's, you know, uh, house yeah. play yeah yeah which was way in i mean that was a real thai you know home village yeah was, oh yeah um, yeah well it was, yeah they built stuff around there but it was just this little 95 year old lady's home hmm. literally in her family 
I mean, I can remember going upstairs in that little house where you don't really see the upstairs and changing and everything. And, you know, this 95 year old lady to digress a little bit is rolling cigarettes and saying, "Eh, if you want to stay tonight, you can, you know, because she's got this hot uh, 25 year old, 30 year old guy, you know, changing white boy. (laughs) You You get to see the show. And of course Uh, you did it. Of course. (laughs) Of course. I mean, you know, they're holding up a towel for me, but I don't give a damn if old lady's there. Honestly, when you're on, Bruce, you know this, you, you're taking your clothes off in front of 75 people, you know, because you're doing a film. I mean, you know, you don't have time to go. There were no trailers in the jungle. I mean, come on, guys. So, you know, it is what it is. But anyway, so Sherry came out, and she just was having a bad day or a bad night. And we had all, finally, we were at that location for about a week. We had all, all finally gotten used to being miserable in this heat, in this uh, location, way out. I mean, NG wouldn't even pay for soda for the crew over there, okay? So I started paying for sodas and for, you know, ice and for things like that for the crew to drink because he wouldn't do it. And he finally did it because, I, you know, he, he was embarrassed by the fact that I was I was getting that. Fair Sherry came out. Off, you know, it's a 50 minute bus ride, another 40 minute ride down a Klong and one of these Thai boats that's basically got a V8 engine and a big, huge, long propeller on it, taking her out there. And she was having a fit. A fit. Why am I here? You know, really, you know, going off the rails. And so I, t- I pulled her aside and I said, Sherry, look, please, we've all gotten used to how miserable this is. We've been out here for a week. You've been at the hotel relaxing. You know, uh, I I remember going into her room. She had a stack of tins of butter cookies about as high as my waist. Okay. So she was in there, you know, eating bonbons and watching TV. And we were out there busting our ass. So I pulled her aside. I said, listen, can you please just, just take it easy, calm down. We really need to get this done. And um, she took offense to that. She was like, you know, how dare you kind of thing. But she did calm down. Now, Lorenzo, Lorenzo called me after he busted my nose to go back to him uh, and said, and he was crying. He's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm like, dude, just buy me some flowers. Come and visit me or something like that. No problem. He never did any of that. So I sued him and I got oh, you sued some him. money. Oh. Yeah, oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. Because I don't have the money to pay for a nose job. Okay, you want me to pay for you breaking my face? Okay, I don't yeah. think so. Yeah. So I got a lawyer. I sued him, sued the production company because they weren't going to pay my hospital bills. I needed to have my nose put back. I needed to have, you know, uh, for a year go through. I didn't get knocked out. I'm very proud of the fact that I didn't lose consciousness. <laughs> okay. but, but, then, but then here's what happened. I had gone to a con in 1991. I had met Joseph Marahi of Pepin mm-hmm. Marahi Entertainment, and he offered me a three-picture deal. And I, and I thought, ah, I'm going to shop around, you know, because I'd seen some of their content, and I wasn't really impressed. And so right. I should have probably signed that deal because later on they never used me, which is fine. You know, honestly, their stuff compared to what I did would have been a downgrade. Honestly, mm. sorry, but it's true. If you know, if you like some of their movies, great. But as far as I was concerned, after doing all of these great martial arts films, to go and do this with these guys, I wasn't. But I probably should have yeah, signed the contract. There are so many to... different layers and shells in terms of productions, martial arts films productions in that era that it's like, yeah, it's it's a different flavor for sure. So you're probably gonna do yeah. what uh, you got. Uh, you would have gotten what Dr- Don the Dragon Wilson got later on, like stuff like Ring of Fire and stuff like that. Which is great for Don. You know, I love Don. He's such a cool guy. He's terrific. Very smart. You know, uh, Coast Guardsman. Uh, is a, is an engineer. He's got a brain. Uh, He's an engineer. Back, I didn't know that. Yeah, hmm. he went to school and you know to be an engineer, and he served in the in the Coast Guard and discharged honorably. And he is the probably the greatest kickboxer um, ever uh, because of all of the fights that he won and who he who he fought with. Now, look, I wouldn't want to get in the ring with him, but. Hmm. 
when we did when we did our virtual combat movie, you know, I was making him, you know, he, he and Andrew uh, Andrew Stevens was directing, you know, he, he cut out a lot of my good stuff because I was making him look like he was standing still. But the thing is, is that back to what happened with uh, me and PM Entertainment, Sherry Rose and Lorenzo Lamas. All of a sudden, they're calling my agent and they're saying, oh, well, we'd like to work with Lauren, but he's difficult. Mm, okay. You know, uh, Lorenzo has a problem with him and Sherry's got a problem with him. I'm not difficult. I'm, I was trying to do my job in King of the Kickboxers and she came on the set and was being difficult. So I had a talk with her. Lorenzo was on his high horse at that time doing his B movies. And I had sued him for busting my face. So they, I had to write a letter of apology and all of this stuff. And I'm like, why do I have to do this? This is ridiculous. Don't you understand the other side of the story? Like there's two sides to this story in this situation. Why should I write a letter to Pepe Merhi and to Sherry Rose and to Lorenzo Lamas apologizing for doing the right thing? Yeah. But okay, fine. What is it? I'll write this stupid letter. And it didn't do a damn thing for me, you know, honestly. Um, and Lorenzo Lamas, Sherry Rose disappeared and she went off into nowhere land. Um, and Lorenzo, you know, he ended up losing all of his money and, uh, you know, is, I think, happily married now and flies helicopters. So good for them. But basically, I was given, I was painted like, uh, like I was difficult to work with, which anybody who knows me knows I am the, the last thing from that, okay? The last thing. I, I fight for things when it comes time for that, but it's for quality. It's for the film. It's for the mm -hmm. project. It's for... It's for what we're doing together as a team. And you're quite outspoken it. about yourself. I mean, I mean, there's no, I feel like I can pretty much ask you anything. I mean, you're so out in the open about who you are. And uh, I realized mm -hmm. that you also had, I'm not going to say a run-in, but in the King of the Kickboxers and whatnot, uh, you were trying to obviously get your stuff done in terms of the action, right? You're the main actor. You want to be able to do the stuff. Uh, and I don't know, the falls, the jump kicks, everything. And uh, the stuntmen were kind of looking at you like, oh, sh we're, we're going to be out of work if you keep doing it. How, how was that? How was that experience? That was actually on No Retreat 2. Oh, it that's, was the, that's the right away part. on No Retreat, yeah. Because I wanted to get uh, Bruce as much experience, and I wanted the the the, the camera mm -hmm. to see me doing as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Have the doubles come in and do their thing, but let me get some experience here working with rigging, doing these athletic and acrobatic things. Mm -hmm. I can remember trying to teach myself how to do an aerial during the whole uh, River Kwai um, monk fight scene thing, you know, which I just didn't know how to do. I wasn't trained as a gymnast. I was trained as a, as a martial, as a martial artist. artist. Yeah. But I wanted to see if I could do that aerial, which is, you know what an aerial is? It's a, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a, a curve with, without your hands. Without without your hands. Your hand. Right. So I was trying to teach myself how to do that. I was trying to do all these things and they would say, Lauren, 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 no, 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 no. Take a rest, take a rest. If you do all of this, so we know work. And I finally made a deal with Yun Kuei and with the guys to just say, you know what, let me try. You guys do your thing and then choose whatever in the editing room works. Mm -hmm. But give me the chance to get some experience because I want to be as good as you guys are. I'm not trying to take anything away from what your jobs are. I have so much respect for you and what you're doing. But I want to be able to get let the audience see me do it if I can. Now, of course, there, there's some things they're not going to let me do because if I die at the end of yeah. this, if it's I the end of the movie, my neck, <laughs> end of the movie, there's all that money <laughs> right down the toilet. Yeah, I grew up watching those movies and it's like, oh, these are the greatest things ever. But then I realized, of course, for them, it had to be a hassle at some times. But you got great stories like you were practicing in, in the with Billy Blanks and Keith Cook. You guys were practicing in the hotel hallway. Yes. Oh, that, that. that must have been the greatest oh, thing. Oh. Tell me about it. it. 
so cool. And I got to say, just to interject, yeah, that fight, that dream fight with Keith mm. and Billy, and it's black in the background and it's oh, supposedly yeah. praying. In the and, ring, and, right? Uh, yeah. Right. I looked at that. Cause I'm getting chicken skin chills right now thinking wow. about it. I saw that and I thought to myself, Jesus Christ, what am I doing in this movie? These guys should have their own their own movies going on, just the two of them mm -hmm. uh, teaming up or doing whatever. Now, look, God bless Keith Cook. There's a Keith Hirabayashi, right? He's, yeah. he's, Billy's a whole six inches taller than he is, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, or, or more. But the fact is, is that the two of them, they're so ripped. They're so cut up. And even now, Keith is like, he's wow. like a Donna, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, uh, and just an amazing athlete, truthfully. Mm -hmm. And to work with him was phenomenal as well. To digress a little bit, uh, Yun Kui came out, and Keith was having trouble with this one part of the gaff, one part of the fight, where he has to do three spin kicks. Oh, yeah. yeah. And he said, he said, uh, he said, man, I can't get around on this third one. Because, you know, we're working together. We're, we, we had a great rapport. All of us, Billy, Keith, and I, because why? We're martial artists. These are two world champions, and oh. I'm able to hang with them. So I already, Billy had already come to me and said, Lauren, it's your movie. I want it to be great. Whatever we need to do, I am there for us and for the film. And that's just, that's the most beautiful thing that you can have in, in that in that uh, kind of situation. So Keith comes to me and he goes, man, I'm having trouble getting around the certain one. I said, jump. And sure enough, he goes, shoot, 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 bang. And he, he does that jump, and it is phenomenal. And then as far as the split round kick, which Keith had done in a couple of movies, I think he does it in China O'Brien. I think mm -hmm. he does it in some other ones. But, um, you know, the spacing on that is very difficult. So he did the right thing. He did the split, which is a total miss. And then the guy's there, and he does the roundhouse kick. Bang! He hits the guy. There's blood coming out of his ear, out of his mouth. And, oh, he actually hit shot. the guy. Oh, oh, yeah. And I mean, let me tell you, when they say, oh, flying kicks, you're going to fall down. Yeah. No. Uh -uh. Let me tell you who fell down. That dude was boom. <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you who fell down. <laughs> Blood coming out of the ear and out of the mouth. And, you know, Keith didn't want to hurt anybody. He doesn't want to hurt anybody. I'll <laughs> tell you a funny story too about, about that. Uh, <laughs> Keith and I were doing the training scene. And I have this thing wrapped around me. And Keith knows where to kick. First of all, Keith is, you know, pinpoint accurate. Mm -hmm. He kicks me once and he, he knocks the wind out of me. <laughs> with the little roundhouse kick snap. And, but he hits me right in the solar plexus. And I go, ooh, and I can't finish the rest of the scene. So I'm like, get it, get it, get it, give me a minute. <laughs> you know, so I said, brother, next time when you kick me, just – just barely touched me or whatever and he did, you know, because he had that control. But it happens, you know, if you're breathing in at the wrong time, even if you're flexing your, your abs, you're, you know, he can still knock it with that because he had that pinpoint accuracy and that power. Um, so, you know, but working with these guys and being around them and our camaraderie was just absolutely through the roof. Um, and, and, uh, and if I was, it, if I was really, difficult to work with, you think that we would have that kind of that kind of ambiance, that kind of, of camaraderie or, or any kind of uh, things that we did? No, of course. Because if you have really you, – if you don't have that teamwork – I mean, think about – first of all, Billy Blanks. He could pick the buttons off of your shirt. He was mm. so fast. And he's 235 mm. pounds when he begins this film. I'm 170 pounds soaking wet. <laughs> and and he would do this thing where he'd say, you know, hold up your hand. I'm going to jab your hand twice. I mean full jabs, you know, pop, pop. Full jabs out and back before you can move your hand. Oh, man. He could do it. I don't care who it was. I don't care if it was uh, Sugar Ray Leonard holding his hand up. He could bite, hit, the, hit your hand twice. So Billy's control and his power were just – unmatched unbelievable and there's some 
footage of him going around doing the, the publicity circuit on YouTube of him actually breaking cinder blocks, breaking boards at these video software uh, dealer companies where mm -hmm. we would go and meet people. I went on a two week tour. So did he when uh, King of the Kickboxers came out. But the fact is, is working out with these guys and having this camaraderie and having this rapport and Keith, I think this was Keith's really like his first starring role or, or co-starring role. I believe and he just knocked so. it out of the park. I think he knocked it out of the park, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of my favorite things is when I say to him, I said, oh, yeah, you know, I'm giving him a hard time. You know, yeah, life, looking through life through the bottom of a bottle. And, he's, and, he, and he walks up and he hits his head. And I don't know if they did this on purpose to have this little piece of wood come down. He hits his head. He says, "Doesn't look too bad," and he walks away. You know? All you could teach me is what life looks like from the inside of a bottle. Oh, it doesn't look too bad. But it was just phenomenal working with these guys because here you have two professionals, really. Yeah, Whether and you provided a great comic relief. The way you deal with like oh, that, that nonsense, that mystical shit. <laughs> yeah. This is what I hate about well, the that, Orient that, guys, that, man. I love that scene. I love that scene. The New York cop, you know, over there, you know, like <laughs> who's so cocky to begin with. He's doing it again, you know. I don't need you guys. I can handle these guys alone. So that character was, you know, of course, larger than life. Yeah, and um, you know. It was just so much fun, fun to do all of this hard, hard work. And and it was cover your cover your ass time all the time. Mm -hmm. They had punji sticks in that clong water that were real bamboo sharpened sticks. I walked around, walked those stage different platforms, and I'm like, are those real bamboo? I said, what if somebody, never mind me. What if somebody on the crew slips and falls in? I mean, are you? Do you realize that someone can be killed? And so they replace them with rubber and things like that. But you would always have to cover your ass, really. And um, let me tell you, Billy and everything that that Keith and Billy and I did was as realistic as it could be. And um, it was hard. I mean, really, we. Were, I know all of us were bruised up. Um, Billy had lost about 30 pounds by the yeah, time we throughout the, the, the shoot. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so. he, yeah he, he was already maximized. So by being well, in that, that great heat. When, right. And, and us, all of us. And the when humidity. You see him, when you see him for the, fir the first shot of him and the, the first time he is in the film, is when uh, Bruce Fontaine is there and he gets the, the hook in the chin and gets pulled up. And um, Billy says, they are waiting for me or whatever. Yeah. And you come in and you see this guy. He's 235 in that shot. And he is just massive, massive. And look, uh, again, just such a blessing to work with such an incredible group of martial artists and great stunt men, stunt people. Tony Leon Shin Hong, who is the Green Dragon Master in the first Ip Man, oh, was yeah. the fight choreographer and the stunt coordinator on those films. Uh, Dee Dee was on both of them. Dee Dee's a very famous Hong Kong stunt, uh, stunt guy. Dee Dee, actually, when we were doing the, the fight uh, tests for Blood Brothers, the day that Keith broke his arm, uh, had me try to chase him around that little studio to kick him. He said, just, just try to hit me. Just, just try to hit me. I couldn't catch this guy. I could not. And I was, I was thick then too. I was about at 195. I had bulked up, man. I was training like an animal six hours a day for that, uh, film because I knew what to expect after no Pre no surrender two. And I wanted to be ready. And it was shot right here near where I live. Uh, now I live in Clearwater, Florida. And we shot it in Clearwater and in Tampa. Oh, and um, yeah, so, but it was just phenomenal to be around all of these great, great, talented athletes and incredible martial artists. Really, I mean, for the day, incredible martial artists. 
Now you've got guys like Scott Adkins. And oh, yeah. You, you have, you know, who is an incredible athlete as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and you have a different level of kicking or trickstering or athleticism. But, you know, Scott got started doubling Hugh Jackman in, in Wolverine, in, mm-hmm. you know, X-Men Origins Wolverine and, and all of that. Um, and now look at it. You know, I'd love to – to, you know, Keith and I have talked about this. We, we want to try to get something together with, and so has uh, have a few others talked about, you know, Scott what, and I doing stuff together. So what, we'll see what happens. What role haven't you done that that would be something that you would love to try? What type of role? Any type of role specifically? You know, it's been so long since I've acted, really been an actor in front of the camera because I digressed to be a dad and started doing stunt work. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, you know, honestly, I wrote a couple of scripts for myself that I would like someone like Scott to do. I'd like to direct now. Uh, So as far as doing something, I would rather sit in the chair and, and make somebody else look good and, Mm -hmm. and do that. As far as playing a role, you know, it really depends on what the script is all about. Uh, so many times, Bruce, my name was used to raise money for movies at, at film markets that I was never in. And, uh, you know, so look, I haven't been in front of the camera. There's talk about this and talk about that, but it would have to be something that would be worthwhile okay. to, to just, to get me to come back out again. Honestly, it's not about the money. It's not about that. It's about whether this would work and what do I want people to see of me now? Because look, you have all of these guys that are of my age group. I think Gary Daniels is still doing some stuff, but he's a little younger. Mm-hmm. Name somebody else of my era that's still working. Hmm. That's not easy. Maybe uh, b- 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 James Liu? James is a fight choreographer. Not yeah, mo- mostly. Movie. Yeah, mostly behind the scenes, maybe. Right. You no, know, like so, Philip so, Re, like Sam Marie, like um, yeah. Think about it for a second. There's yeah. not a whole lot of folks that want to see old guys out there, you know, playing certain roles. Now, I'm mm-hmm. not saying that we can. Not so fast. I'm not saying. Okay. Because, for example, Mel Gibson looks like a real badass in these latest action movies that he's done. I would love to see guys your age doing a lot of action. Yes, I would. I, especially because you look so fit. You just well, posted you a go. picture. You just posted a yeah. picture that I was like, damn, those guns. I mean, I, I, I want to know. That's pr- part of the last part of uh, our interview. Um, sure. What I would like to know is uh, what are you doing nowadays in terms of fitness? How is your workouts? How are, how are your workouts? And what's your diet if you have any special diet, whatever? How do you keep so fit? Well, the thing about it is, is it's everybody has their own, you know, look, I, I have used, you only have a certain amount of use of your body, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and as, I'll be 58 in a month. Um, I t- attribute it to good genes. What I do as far as training is I can't do all of this, you know, crazy stuff anymore. I can do enough to make a film mm-hmm. and to do stuff. Yeah, but, you know, helicopter kicks, jumping split kicks, not on the table anymore. So what I do for training is, is like what I just did earlier today. I'm outside, I'm landscaping, I'm, you know, cutting the grass, I'm doing what I'm doing outside. Later today, if the beach is open, I'll go down to the beach, I'll get in the water. I That picture that you saw, I had just come out of just getting in that great salt water and bouncing around for an hour because I'm one sixth my weight. I'm in the water there in the sea and salt water is phenomenal for your body. Uh, if it's clean, you know, there's a lot of places in the world that are so clean. And so, so what, what do I do as far as training? I do a lot of isometrics. I do Mm -hmm. lift weight but I do very, very low poundage, high reps. Mm-hmm. I 
my diet consists of like I had a cheat meal today. Mm -hmm. I ate eggs and corned beef hash. But what do I eat normally? I'm eating a lot of fruit. I'm eating a lot of protein, but balanced and trying to stay away from sugar, mm -hmm. trying to stay away from stuff that's not good for me. But, you know, that's discipline. I don't, I do, I do drink beer. I will have an occasional whiskey or whatever, but you know, I don't do any drugs. I'm all natural. I mean, I've been known to, you know, smoke pot every once in a while. Who didn't? <laughs> Bruce Lee, everybody, everybody, every yeah. once in a while. I'm, yeah. in Florida, I'm in Florida now, baby. I'm not in LA where it's legal and I don't break the law. You know, I mean, there is a certain time and a place for everything. The other thing is, is I don't want to be loopy all the time. So I don't know, mm -hmm. the, I don't know how many people, why these people get into, into drugs. I really don't. I don't get it. But the fact is, is that my training regimen depends upon how I'm doing. Look, I have arthritis all throughout my body. I have torn my Achilles on my left, uh, my left um, leg twice, stranded it out so it wasn't completely torn apart on my right leg. Uh, once. Uh, I have so many injuries. We could do a whole other hour about, you know, all of that. This wrist, the ligament that holds the bones together, totally gone, exploded here, all this stuff. How do I practice martial arts? I still do the forms. I do as much as I can with everything else. I have my ninth degree black belt. I tested for that in both Taekwondo and Hapkido. I go through all of these things, but I can't do a lot of high impact mm -hmm. anymore. Yeah. I don't know how these people that are older or my age do CrossFit, oh. <laughs> do extreme training regimens. To me, it's unhealthy. It is counterintuitive yeah. to me. Now, there is a 1% athlete out there, but as you get older, you should be thinking about what you should you should be going to the doctor and if you have pains here or there look i grew up in the era of everything's gonna look you're, you're a martial artist you're gonna put your hand through bricks you're gonna do this you're gonna break boards you're gonna you know fight five guys you know pain is part of it but eventually stuff catches up with you and for me the discipline right you're a martial artist so you understand the discipline is always going to be about real, realizing, you know, what you need to do when you see that you're slipping or because everybody's human, you know, I mean, you can do whatever you want to do with your own body and eat what you want to eat, but you are what you eat. And also you, the way you present your, your energy with just dealing with people or how you wake up every day with what kind of, with what kind of outlook? Look, I am very fortunate. There's a lot of people going through a lot of suffering right now oh, because yeah. of this uh, unfortunate situation. I'm blessed, but it's also because while I've had the good times, I've also had that same kind of discipline. I've never needed a trainer. I've never needed a dietitian. I've never, I have gone to dietitians. I have had my system broken down, what I should eat now and here and there and there. And I could have spent thousands and thousands of dollars on supplements but you know what i've got some hawaiian papayas growing in my backyard they're phenomenal <laughs> for me. that both kinds of enzyme i eat a lot of berries uh a lot of you know i, I i've gone back to the hunter gatherer sort of diet i don't need all of these uh supplements and yeah things like I, I know what you mean i know what you mean yeah i i think people get a lot of uh they give a lot of credit to that as if it were something that was going to save them or give them more longevity or give them turn them into somebody who's in shape when they haven't been doing the right things over and over again for the last i don't know 30 years so they're not going to be a remedy to anything they're just going to be what they are supplements something additional and uh, you don't really need anything additional if you have been already getting a lot on your plate and not of the good stuff. So, for sure, I mean that's that's the way to that's the way to deal with it. That's the way to look at it, in my in my opinion. Aging is not easy, you know. Uh, but the fact is, is 
it's all mindset. It's all the, you know, the martial arts and all of these disciplines are really, really, really great, great for, you know, uh, for aging. Well, it's what gets you through. Yeah. Correct. The principles, and the core principles that you've grew, grown up with. Lauren, scientific yes, thank you so much for this. It was incredible. I uh, mean, to, to, to catch up. I mean, I still can't believe I'm talking to, you know, it, it has been a ride, you know, for me. I've, I've started with actually the first one was Simon Ree. So he's like the godfather of this podcast. So uh, it has been certainly a ride to speak with some of my childhood heroes. And I want to thank you so much because uh, it was once more this, uh, this great honor to, to, to have you just for myself for a couple of hours. So thank you so much. And uh, I hope to see, uh, to see you soon. And I'm going to tell everybody to follow you on Instagram. Is there anything else you want to plug in? Just to say thank you, Bruce, for what you do, for giving me the opportunity to share And, um, you know, I'm always around. So anybody who wants to contact me can find me on Instagram at Lauren Avedon official. And then I might be phasing out Facebook just because it's becoming more time consuming mm. than really what it's worth. Um, and then Lauren mm -hmm. uh, is, is also something that we're going to be improving, moving it to Google servers so that we can handle all the traffic. And then I'm trying to get this warrior wear dot clothing going uh, it's an uh, idea of my daughter's and mine to try to help charities like unhcr unicef save a warrior canines for warriors uh, those are probably too many charities to really be working on but it's great artwork that has been done um, on some of my characters and movies and things like that and adaptations that we've put on apparel we're just getting started it's really at the cocoon phase but still want to try to make a difference. So that's, that's what it's all about. I think that's what you're doing. So thank you for the opportunity to speak and share with uh, your audience and to talk to you, Bruce. Thank you so much for that opportunity, brother. Thank you and have a great trip to Serbia and have a great marriage. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Congrats. Here, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you forget, like, I'm getting married. In, in, in how many days? <laughs> it's a good time. It's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> don't freak out, care. okay? I don't, won't, I won't. Don't I'm freaking watch, out now with you yeah. so I can be cool. Yeah. Don't watch a lot of marriage movies and divorce movies and, you know, everybody, every love story. In, in, don't, don't watch love stories, okay? Don't watch, don't watch Kramer versus been Kramer. There, <laughs> been, there, done, been there, done that, got the daughter. I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Oof. <laughs> See you, brother. Thank you so much. All right. God bless. <laughs> See you, thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs>